Shades of Entrepreneurship, where we interview entrepreneurs to inspire the future entrepreneur. I'll be your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. So grab a drink, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. created his first LLC at the age of 19 to pay for tuitions, books, and the cost of living while attending Michigan State University. After three years, he launched his own franchise. Please welcome the founder of Lime Painting, Nick Lopez. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, I have the CEO and founder of Lime Painting, Nick Lopez. Nick, how are we doing? I'm doing fantastic. How are you? I'm good. I'm doing great. Uh, You know, painting, I think what we're going to talk about today is something that everybody needs. I just recently purchased a home. I don't think you uh, realized exactly how much you need and how often you need it. But before we get into lime painting, let's introduce the world. Who is Nick Lopez? Oh, my gosh. Well, it depends on what hat I'm wearing. But I'm, I'm very much a values-based uh, person. Uh, my four Fs are uh, my faith, family, friends, and franchising. So that's pretty much my world. Um, business, franchising, high-performance personal development. Uh, this day, uh, these days, I'm helping people realize their dreams through entrepreneurship uh, by becoming business owners. Uh, or really transforming their careers through uh, the sales roles and and other positions at Lime. Uh, so, you know, I have the absolute honor of uh, helping people level up and and change their life and um, you know create a reality for themselves that um, that they want and and doing it through our platform. And the value that we give at Lime. Yeah, let's let's get into that. What exactly is Lime painting? So Lime painting is uh, the nation's uh, largest uh, luxury painting and coatings company. Uh, we were st- we were founded in uh, 2013 in Denver, Colorado. Uh, but I actually started my painting career uh, 15 years ago. I was a freshman at Michigan State and uh, ran a paint company there for five years. Never thought I would own a paint company or scale one nationally. And the opportunity just kept growing. And it became pretty clear that, um, you know, the the value that I was giving in a very underserved and fragmented industry, you know, I, I really liked that threshold, that baseline that I was competing with, just showing up, answering my phone, doing a good job. And, and I was crushing it. So, you know, back in college, that uh, was something that I, I felt good about competing in. And, and uh, I just had to get over the fact that I wasn't going to be the uh, commercial real estate develop, development person that I thought I was go- going to be. Um, and uh, yeah, this, this path of, of working in contracting and blue collar I've absolutely loved it. Uh, specifically, what we do working on luxury estates, really the top third of home values uh, in a market. You know, um, I've really fallen in love with the process of uh, going in those folks' homes, getting to know them personally, building those personal relationships. And, and as you were mentioning, paint, right? You're painting an exterior and interior, it's very transformative. You have immediate gratification. And doing it on you know multi million dollar estates, uh, for me and the folks at Lime that, at Lime that join, you know that's very gratifying. Um, giving that very basic, straightforward need that whether it's a it's a booming economy or a recession, uh, you know home services and specifically painting, uh, and when you're talking about putting a protective coating on an estate. 
you know, all of a sudden it's a need. It's not only a want in that it looks great, but uh, and it's probably one of the most satisfying services that you can have on something that you own. Um, but, you know, as you start really looking at paint, it's a type of coating. It's one of many different coatings and, and it protects surfaces from sun and water damage. And when you have a really expensive home, you have all these uh, surfaces that make up the estate, each one turns over, deteriorates, and you know we're able to educate clients on the fact that, look, paint is just one of many different coatings, and all of these other surfaces are also deteriorating. And so this is the process for how it works. Here are highly vetted solutions. You know we're we're working with a demographic, a buyer that wants to pay more to get more. They care about quality. And, and so that's our positioning. Everything that we've done about line painting has been building the business to bring that particular consumer the most value as possible. And, you know, it, uh, it really started for me back in college. You know, you mentioned college. You went, you went to Michigan State. You also mentioned, briefly, you mentioned real estate. Now, I'm assuming, what, what did you go to college for? One, and then two, how did you get into painting? Uh, great question. I uh, went to college for business. I was a marketing major, and uh, the program I was talking about was at the University of Miami, and in particular, is a master's degree in real estate development. And you also get your JD, so ultimately you would get into uh, real estate development. And um, again, that was the sexy job title for me. Oh yeah, oh yeah. But. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, this industry just kept wooing me along. So, so how did you get into the painting industry? Did you kind of do it as a side hustle during college? Exactly. Yeah my my dad ran a uh, concrete business, and so in high school, on and off, I worked for it. And um, so, yeah, blue collars in my blood, most certainly. But had uh, the entrepreneurship bug as well, and and uh, wanted to go to business school and. A lot of folks don't necessarily use their degrees. I used 100% of my degree. Once I learned about franchising, uh, that was midway through school, really right before I started getting in my business major and, and sales program and marketing degree. I really just baked everything I learned in the classroom into the, into the business model that, you know, back then a mentor introduced me to this idea of franchising by a book called E-Myth revisited by Michael Gerber. And that's where I learned about systems and process and replicating the same service um, and, and doing it through the franchise model and working on the business, not in it. Um, so everything was about systematizing and preparing to franchise. I, and I had time on my side, so I was able to be methodical and, and uh, intentional about um, progressively building infrastructure and proving out the business model and then learning about franchising and everything else prior to even franchising in, in, uh, in 2018, when we started expanding through franchising. So let's talk about scaling. Cause I think, I think I, there's a, probably a lot of entrepreneurs listening who would love to get to that point where they can in fact franchise their brand, right? Cause that, that's kind of like the ultimate goal for a lot of people. And maybe it should be for most. How did you get to that point? Uh, through many, many years of preparing to franchise. And, you know, I knew, okay, if I get done with college, I'll have five years of working in the business, quote unquote, in the laboratory and really able to break things and intimately understand at, at the ground level, what does a consumer want? What do the employees want? What are the pain points? Where are the value adds? Where are the bottlenecks? Um, and, and being diligent and methodical, patient about that. Um, you know, I moved home to Denver in 2013, started Lime. Uh, we grew it to a couple, uh, well, uh, we uh, grew it to a couple million dollar location and um, that was over four years. So uh, in that process, we made the business model more and more differentiated. We created more value through services, really going from just paint to coatings and surface restoration. Today, we offer 40 services, but it makes us very sticky, a lot of value um, in the market. And you know, again, that was a lot of breaking and systematizing and, and failing forward 
uh, you know, when you're vetting out highly or high grade uh, solutions for, you know, luxury estates, you're going to mess some stuff up and, and I uh, need to figure out what is the best way to do each service that we offer. And that takes time. So, um, you know, spent the, the four years really standardizing the business. And, and then I joined an organization called the International Franchise Association. And they offer a lot of education. It's a phenomenal networking organization. But if you're looking for anything franchising, the International Franchise Association is where you want to go. Uh, so I joined, I traveled around the country for about a year and a half. They offer a lot of different credits that you can take to learn about franchising. And that was something that I appreciated about my degree in in college was that I actually used it and I benefited greatly from it. And our employees and the model just proved itself out because it was built on systems and processes that I had learned in college. And, and so I knew I didn't want to wing franchising. I didn't want to figure it out on my own. Again, figuring it out and becoming successful means failing forward. So um, I wanted to go and learn from people that had failed forward already. And so um, that that process began. And uh, then you fast forward uh, a couple of years down the road and uh, we onboarded our first franchise owner and, and then uh, subsequent next few. And those were our legacy owners over 2018, 2019. And again, took our time scaling, figuring out, okay, where did it not work so well from our corporate locations to our new franchise owners? Where are the bottlenecks there? And really leveled up the business to be um, easier for the average owner, right? Not perfect, but uh, that much more systematized to make the business easy for the average franchise owner. I shouldn't say easy, but um, more relatable and uh, more turnkey. And that blueprint is more tailored for the average owner. So, you know, you get a good feel for that with your legacy owners, those initial owners. Um, And then from there, we, we knew that we had a business model that not only provided a ton of value to consumers in the market, but that was going to provide jobs in communities and empower folks to be employers uh, and and together to be able to work in the market to deliver our service. And that's awesome um, for all the reasons that it is. But again, um, you know, it's just that um, methodical, intentional process and uh, doesn't necessarily happen overnight. And I can't speak to it happening overnight, I guess is what I'm trying to say. So you know, I got into scaling and, and growing nationally and doing it through franchising. In August of 2020, we had seven locations uh, today in uh, Q2 of 2023, we have 80. Um, and so I can speak to a story of providing value. And I guess that's probably what I just talked around is it's providing value to the consumer in the market. And it's providing value to somebody that says, hey, I want to get into business ownership for myself, but I don't want to be in business by myself. I don't want to start something from scratch, go through all the trials and errors, figure it out, the, you know, pull out my hair, uh, lose sleep, invest money, lose money, you know, all that good stuff to, to start something from scratch. Um, you know, somebody that wants to be in business and do it through franchise ownership is their value for that individual. And, you know, if you can say yes to both, both of those things that you're providing tremendous value to the consumer, tremendous value to the franchise owner, um, then, you know, that's a viable business model that would be successful scaling through franchising. You, you know, you let's, let's, you, I'm going to unwrap some of that stuff. Cause this is some amazing stuff right here. So one, you, you kind of talked about, um, it's not easy, but you made it easy by creating these processes. And this kind of takes me back to a, a conversation I had with the owner of Twist Yoga from down in Lake Oswego, talks about the importance of processes and, and having those in place. 
how important have the processes and what processes do you put in place to kind of ensure a successful business? Mm, that's a great question. I say, first and foremost, you need to execute the process. And uh, secondly, follow the process. Uh, so we talk a lot about behavior equals outcome. And that's a beautiful thing when there's an effective process in place that works is the more you work it, the more outcome you get. And then it turns into to managing the outcome, right? Uh, and so if you do X, you do Y, you get Z. You do X, you do Y, you get Z. Then next thing you know, you have all these Zs, you're trying to figure out what to do with them, right? That's good process. That's good systems. And uh, you shouldn't be ambiguously winging the same things over and over. If you have a sales process, which you should, every organization does, it should be standardized. And uh, whether it's somebody in New Jersey or somebody in Boise or somebody in Denver, everybody understands the same sales process and is executing on it and can speak to it and coach it um, because it's the Lime way or that business's way of doing business, their process in which they do it. Um, but yeah, the scale is done through process for that reason. Yeah. And, 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 you know, you mentioned to value, uh, value, right. But you're creating value to the consumer because you're, you're, you're helping them at their home. But, and then you're also from the franchisee's perspective, you're creating value back to the entrepreneur by putting these processes in place to make it easier for them to be successful in their business as well. Them, their, their employees, and for everyone to be on the same page, speaking the same language, benefiting from the fact that, hey, look, I'm not in business by myself. I'm in business with others. And if we're collectively executing the same model, we're compounding the uh, likelihood that we're going to level up the business, make it more efficient, more streamlined. Um, and, and that's the power of the franchise model. Yeah, I completely agree. Now, you mentioned you know education, going to school, utilizing this, this information. And it sounds like, but I just want to ask, is this in fact your first business? Uh, I, I ran a, a business in college called Spartan college painters. And, uh, that was my first business. Now, what was that? What'd you do? Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I, uh, started off by hiring other college kids and, uh, that made up a few paint crews and, um, and then eventually started hiring professional painters my second year thereafter, um, kind of the same model. But um, yeah, those those were the the early days of my painting career and ha had a lot of fun, um, created a, a fun culture and and uh, built some great friendships. And that was that was a very fun season of my life. You know, I'm not going to lie. It looks like you are still having fun with this, <laughs> but, but I got to ask, you know, you've been doing quite a bit. You're, you're starting to grow. You're starting to franchise. This is, you know, one of your, this is your second business and now you're taking it nationally, right? What's been difficult about starting this business? Difficult. That's a, that's an interesting question. And I, you know, I think what is what has been the most difficult uh, has been realizing that uh, there's a top twenty, a middle sixty, and a bottom bottom twenty in any organization on any team, and uh, you know, for me, it's been difficult approaching the business from that standpoint i uh, and you know i just was uh, telling my team that you know communication should be an entire degree it should be a department in business it should be a whole subject matter in a business degree you know i never learned about anything related to just internal communication within a business and you, even you get into the International Franchise Association. Uh, and, and so communication and how you're communicating to the top 20, middle 60, bottom 20 across an organization, how you're influencing change. If you're a, if you're a growing, competing organization, you're always going to be changing uh, because the, business, the marketplace is always evolving and you need to remain competitive 
innovative. Um, and so how are you communicating and influencing that change, creating that engagement and an adoption um, that, that is ultimately your culture. And if you're not intentional about it, you know, your, your culture will be defined by something. So you sure as heck better be defining it. And we have been great at culture because I have a wrestling background. I have an athletic background. I, I love the locker room uh, mentality and everything about the locker room, the camaraderie, the teamwork, the culture, the process of winning, and you're going through the work and the journey together, you're losing together. And that just creates incredible culture. And that's, that's doing anything great with other people. Uh, and so, you know, naturally and, and coming from that world, uh, that's been something that has naturally uh, been a, a plus for me is the culture piece. Uh, but what, to answer your question, what's been challenging is getting beyond just you know, 20 locations, 50 locations, a team of two, a team of 10, a team of, you know, over, you know, a hundred, it changes and you're no longer able to communicate so intimately and in depth one-on-one. So again, my point there is, you know, communication should be an entire yeah, I know there is a, you can get a communication degree, but even just within a business degree, communication is, uh, you know, at least maybe I wasn't paying attention in those classes. That's probably what it was, but no, I'm agree. paying attention now. You know, can you, for the listeners at home, explain the six, the 2060 20. So, you know, you'll have a top 20 per, uh, set of performers. You'll have a middle 60% of performers and a bottom 20. Uh, it doesn't matter what you're doing. You're, you're, uh, you know, on a wrestling team, you're on a basketball team, you're, uh, you know, within a, an organization like Mind Painting, you're going to have your top performers, your middle performers, and your bottom performers. If you assume everyone's a top performer, you're not going to coach the middle and bottom correctly, right? You're not going to commute, you're not going to relate to where they are you're probably missing the ball in, in, in speaking right over their head because you're coming from just a high performer mentality, but you know, you need to speak to that bottom 20 percenter and help open their world, pull back the onion so that they can graduate to the middle and uh, so on and so forth. Um, so looking at an organization that has, you know, a lot of people within it um, you can't look at it as again, one-on-one or, or general, it, you know, there's, um, for the most part, those three different sections of performance, just speaking from a performance standpoint, which at the end of the day in business, that's what it comes down to. And that's ultimately what we're talking about is performance, like average unit volume, average owner volume. What is the sales revenue? That is, that is your report card as a business owner. What's your revenue? It's black and white and, you know, profitability and the P and L it's very objective. Um, so, you know, when you talk about revenue, top 20, uh, middle 60 and, uh, bottom 20. Man, what very, very well said. So what would you say this process, you know, going through it is, has there anything been easy? Easy. Um, you know, I would say that you know, what comes easy is the people piece, right? So LIME stands for love, integrity, mission, and excellence. Oh, nice. Nice. And, you know, we are so diligent about vetting franchise partners and recruiting on a location level around our values. And so uh, that has actually created an infectious culture that I didn't even anticipate, but it, it starts to take on a life of its own. And, um, you know, having an organization that stands for values that are beyond just, you know, slogans on a coffee cup that are lived out and, and set as an example, um, you know, it, I think that at its core makes uh, working with the people that you work with pretty easy. 
And, uh, you know, creating anything great, doing anything special, it's going to be a grind. Um, if it's not, you're not working hard enough. <laughs> and, uh, you know, some folks may say, ah, oh, work, 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 whatever, balance, you name it. But, you know, when, when, uh, when you're doing something like we're doing at Lime, growing nationally, uh, you know, we have a lot of folks that are counting on us. And uh, it's important, at least from, in my opinion, for me to do as much as I can for my team and, and, and so that we as a team can do as much as we can for our franchise owners. And uh, as a result, our franchise owners can do as much as they can for the communities that they serve. Um, and so, oh my gosh, it's a, it's a get after it, be consistent. The, the bar is high. It's a high performance culture. Nice. Now this next question is kind of a two part question because you talked about the logo on the coffee cup. You talked about, you know, working for your franchise, you know, really, really doing a lot. So one, how do you brand and market the franchise becoming, you know, enticing and, and entrepreneurs becoming franchise owner. And then two, what marketing collateral do you give them as a franchise owner to help build their actual business? Sure. I'll speak to the latter uh, first. Um, so uh, we have a whole marketing department and uh, we'll, we'll create any tailored designs for our owners for whatever marketing piece that they need. But the full marketing mix, um, from direct mailers to leave behinds to one sheeters, uh, and uh, you know any any seasonal promotions, those are all preset in a marketing calendar. Um, and our marketing team does a beautiful job of you know making these customizable for you in the market, uh, so you can easily plug and play. And, uh, that, that's, that's, uh, personally my favorite department, duh, I'm a marketing major. So, uh, Makes sense. <laughs> um, we, we, uh, we have so many marketing assets, whether it's, you know, pitching to a, a real estate office or an architect or a property management company or a designer, you know, we have decks for every single industry contact that we pursue. Uh, email campaigns, um, you know, a lot of that is just kind of done assets, but we've done a lot of investing in high res video images. Um, and so, you know, as an owner, right out of the box, you just have very professional, uh, a portfolio that you can show clients, uh, of what it can mean to work with Lime. Uh, the amount of value and the solutions that we provide, you know, we're not hiring painters and training them. They're hiring subcontractors, professionals in the market. So we're able to re uh, recruit the best of the best because our clients pay us more to get more. So if you think about Uber Black, you know, that is an upgrade. You're intentionally paying for a nicer vehicle. Uber paired you with a nicer vehicle. We're essentially Uber Black. We're pairing customers that want to pay for highly talented artisans and pairing them on properties, doing all the account management, all that's turnkey, right? But, um, you know, by being able to provide that sort of value to consumers, that's, that's a game changer. But from a, a marketing standpoint, um, you know, we're featuring those accounts, telling those stories. Um, you know, I'm actually flying to Charlotte, uh, or excuse me, Charleston, uh, uh, this upcoming week. And we're featuring a handful of, uh, accounts that he's worked on and turning over that, uh, promotional video for him to use in his market. And, you know, we've done that with, uh, clients and we have a bunch more or excuse me, with franchise owners, we have a bunch more scheduled for the upcoming year. But that is just an example of repurposing. Um, and over time, that database just builds up. Sure, you know, there's different facades and and uh, trees and whatnot from market to market. And 
some in Denver have mountains and whatnot, but that builds to the national brand, right? And, and immediately you are fast forwarded to being a part of Lime Painting, who is a uh, award-winning luxury paint company. Uh, and there are processes in place. There's a way of doing business. And I am the franchise owner, your local neighbor in the community who's bringing this way of business to you, which is ultimately pairing artisans with clients that want to pay more to get more. Um, and on the franchise side, you know, that's the story that we're telling. That's the story that we're sharing is uh, the unique way of doing business that we have standardized as the Lime Way that is highly proprietary, that brings a tremendous amount of uh, results uh, within a location because there are processes, specifically a sales process. Um, you know, I learned a sales program in college and baked it into the business and seen immediate results, and that's driven our growth. Um, again, I've been able to point back in large part to that program and say, look, it's not me. It's, it's this program, you know, we're executing on it. And so we're looking for folks that are just that, uh, you know, they want to be coached, they want to follow a process, and they want to get after it and execute on that process. You know, those are the franchise owners that make for good fits at Lime, you know, that align with our values. Uh, they want to be entrepreneurial. They want all the benefits of independence and freedom and the American dream that is business ownership but they want to fast forward past the startup component of figuring out what's the right way, the most effective way to compete in the market. That's the biggest benefit of a franchise is that you know, you're learning a highly competitive way of doing business that's been built over many, many years, many, many customers, many, many failures. Uh, and, and so you know, that's the marketing message that we're bringing to market. And, you know, that's what folks have signed up for. Uh, and, and we vet heavily, you know, we're not selling franchises. Uh, we're awarding them to folks that uh, we're going to be in business with them for 10 years. We're signing a 10 year franchise agreement and that's a big commitment. So it's more than just making a sale up front. It's, it's welcoming this individual into the line business, the line family. Um, with all the folks that signed up for the same thing, rowing in the same direction. Again, one of the most powerful parts of being in a franchise is being in business with other folks that are continuously executing on the Lime way and it's being innovated along the way. Um, and so even though we're individually operating and running our businesses, we're also growing a national organization, which is essentially increasing the brand value, which is increasing the overall investment from everybody. Um, again, that's really the biggest uh, benefit and most powerful component of the franchise model. Yeah. And, and, and so folks listening, I think what, what Nick's over here telling you is you too can be an entrepreneur and own your own Lime franchise. In fact, if you actually go on their website, we'll talk about their website later, but th these are things you can do, right? As, as an entrepreneur, these are things that you, in fact, have the capabilities of doing. In fact, I was at a conference, a healthcare conference just the other day, talking to an individual. She is from Romania. She says, hey, me and my mom make these Romanian donuts. Uh, we go to Saturday markets all the time thinking about selling them. And so I actually connected her with, you know, former guest Shakira and me, uh, shout out to nice, uh, connected them together. I'm like, Hey, she would love to learn more about doing this. And it's all about doing it right. You, you're really giving them the tools to do it. It's just whether an entrepreneur wants to try to actually do this. Now, what would you say now moving forward? What would you say? What advice do you have for entrepreneurs? You know, it's aspiring entrepreneurs, maybe a, maybe a painter out there, maybe someone that wants to become a franchise owner. What advice do you have for them? You know, I'm such an advocate of blue collar industry uh, industries because I really do think that it's the wave of the future. Um, there's no robots that are going to do uh, home services. There's no AI, right? AI is going to make those businesses better. Uh, but increasingly, home services are becoming 
the thing. And, uh, you know, there, there are uh, projections of the industry growing from 400 billion to, uh, to 800 over the next handful of years, incredible growth in the home services space in blue collar work. Uh, dirty jobs are becoming sexy. And, and so, um, you know, I, I guess I just advocate for uh, the blue collar space and there are sophisticated processes, for example, like what line painting brings where it's more than just a business model, but there's technology, there's um, competent marketing, uh, effective um, uh, marketing and in training and support a full team at your disposal to coach you and, and show you the way for the, the blueprint, the model, right? So this is just franchising in general, but when you're looking at a hot space like home services, a, a, a space that's of the future, um, you know, maybe you say, okay, well, uh, is that big enough for my entrepreneurial op- appetite? Well, you know, you can grow into multiple locations. You can own a whole portfolio of locations and create an infrastructure to support the uh, the locations. That is more sophisticated business ownership where you're not starting at a startup standpoint, you're not beginning at a startup um, position and taking the time to be competitive and ramp up, rather you're jumping right in and scaling across um, multiple locations within an industry that's something that I would introduce to folks that haven't looked into and explored. And, it, you know, it doesn't have to be line painting. It, it's it's uh, franchising in general. I'm a huge advocate of the franchise model as a whole. I truly believe that it is, you know, one of the greatest growth platforms um, ever. And, and so um, this is a, a pretty incredible time to be in franchising and specifically to be in home services. So you can own different um, services within your portfolio of franchises. So you can serve the same market, but from multiple angles, if you own several different service offerings, that's pretty incredible. And I don't think those things are known about franchising right up front. Um, You know, I think you hear about franchising and you think of Burger King or McDonald's, but uh, you know, it's an, it's an incredible growth model and um, look into home services. It's an incredibly hot market or space. And uh, the franchise model is ushering in a lot of innovation and really leveling up the customer experience. And I see that only continuing. I mean, think about the universities that are going to be created from the demand for needing more tradesmen. Um, the home services space is going to change um, pretty rapidly here over the next five years, 10 years. I, I completely agree. I mean, when you're thinking of the home service space, folks, you're thinking not just about, um, you know, home painting. You're thinking about maintenance, right? Exterior and interior, right? Landscaping versus interior. You're doing your vents. You're making sure you're your, your fridge is all clean. I had an individual, uh, I truthfully had somebody come today and do a deep cleaning of our home. We just had a 10 week, we have a, you know, small kid at home, 10 weeks. I'm like, Hey, we need some help. And, and, uh, those services are out there and available. And I would agree. Uh, you know, I know, I know Nick, you, you mentioned quite a bit about education. I would completely agree. You know, I went to Syracuse and went and got my undergrad at Portland state masters at Syracuse and, uh, I, I've used my degree and it's helped me immensely. But there's also a thing to say, I think you're kind of alluding to it too, um, those trade schools as well, there's there's also a great value of those as well. I think I think what really truly Nick is saying is there's value in education. Uh, no matter what kind of form of education it is, there's just value in education. What, is that safe to say? Absolutely. So, so Nick, People are interested. Maybe they want to become a franchise owner. Maybe they want to know more about Nick Lopez. How can they get in contact with you? Website, social media, where can they find you? Uh, you can find me at limepainting.com. 
uh, we have a podcast called uh, Level Up, and uh, you can find tons of content. I uh, interview folks, thought leaders in business, uh, franchising, high performance. Uh, I have a lot of fun with it. And uh, you can find me on LinkedIn. Um, and then also, uh, I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. If you want to send me an email, it's nick at limepainting.com. Perfect. Nick Lopez, the CEO and founder of Lime Painting. I will have this information on the website, theshadesofe.com, which also reminds me to plug the newsletter, the weekly newsletter of The Shades of Entrepreneurship. You can subscribe by visiting theshadesofe.com. We will have this information and Lime Painting information on the newsletter as well as the uh, as well as the website after the episode airs with the transcription of this conversation. So if you'd like to go ahead and read it there, please don't fault me on the grammar, folks. I do not have the time to go through the grammar. I'm going to pa- paste it. Hopefully it catches everything accurately. Nick, is there anything else you would like to say before we leave? I would say whatever it is, just do it. Don't don't let fear steal opportunities from you. Uh, if if you've really leaned in, meaning that it's more than just a you know a, a a nudge, and it's vetted and you're convicted, just do it. I like it. I like it. Just do it. Nick Lopez, the founder and CEO of Lime Painting. Thank you again so much for those listening at home. You can follow me at The Shades of E on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook. Sorry, Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Again, that's at The Shades of E, or you can visit at theshadesofe.com to subscribe to the newsletter. Thank you and have a great night. Thank you for tuning in to The Shades of Entrepreneurship. For more information, please follow The Shades of E on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or visit theshadesofe.com.